All right, so welcome everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. Before we get started, I'd like to ask uh, everyone to please uh, turn off and keep your cameras off and as well as your mics during the presentation. At the end of the presentation, we'll have a Q&A session. And if you have any questions or comments for our speaker, you can share those at that time. All right, again, welcome. So my name is Elvia Ramirez, and I serve as a faculty coordinator for the Center on Race, Immigration, and Social Justice, or Chris J, here at Sac State. We're very excited to host our guest speaker today, Kevin Johnson. Kevin Johnson is dean of UC Davis Law School. He's also the maybe a Paulist professor of public interest law and a professor of Chicana and Chicano studies at UC Davis. He has taught many different classes, including immigration law, civil procedure, complex litigation, Latinos and Latinas and the law, and also critical race theory. In 1993, he was a recipient of the law school's Distinguished Teaching Award. Kevin, Do uh, Kevin Johnson is a distinguished scholar of immigration law and civil rights. He is the author of the book, How Did You Get to Be Mexican? A White Brown Man's Search for Identity, which was nominated for the 2000 Robert F. Kennedy Book Award. Dean Johnson's book, Immigration Law and the U.S.-Mexico Border, which was published in 2011, received the Latino Literacy Now's International Latino Book Awards Best Reference Book. He's also the author of two editions of the textbook, Immigration Law and Social Justice, and he also blogs at Immigration Law Prof. Dean Johnson is a magna cum laude graduate of Harvard Law School and has a very distinguished service record, including having served on the board of directors of the Mexican-American Legal Defense and Education Fund, or MALDEF, which is the leading Mexican-American civil rights organization in the country. Dean Johnson is the recipient of many awards and honors. Here, I'll highlight just a few. The Association of American Law Schools Minority Group Section Clyde Ferguson Award, the Hispanic National Bar Association Law Professor of the Year Award, the National Association of Chicana and Chicano Studies Scholar of the Year Award, and many others. And so, once again, welcome to our esteemed guest speaker, Kevin Johnson. I will now turn it over to our guest speaker. All right. uh, thanks very much for that, for that generous introduction. I, I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, I, I am uh, especially pleased to present this paper at the Center on Race, Immigration, and Social Justice, um, because I, I think that those three issues, race, immigration, and social justice, are important civil rights issues for the 21st century that, that don't get as much attention as, the, as they should. Um, l l let me tell you a little bit of what, what brings me to this paper, uh, and I... I I've been working on this paper for, for a bit uh, for a symposium on immigration and race, and it's entitled The KKK, Immigration Law and Policy in Donald Trump. Uh, and I'll tell you what I'm trying to do in that paper in a second, but I also want to mention a couple things that give you an idea um, of how I uh, uh, think about immigration law uh, is a very practical policy matter that deserves our consideration. Um, uh, I was one of the attorneys that represented the State Bar of California in a case before the California Supreme Court uh, involving Sergio Garcia, an undocumented immigrant seeking to become licensed to practice law in the, in the state. And we were actually very lucky to convince the California Supreme Court to allow undocumented immigrants to be licensed to practice. One of the first states in the union that, that permitted uh, that, that, that to occur. Um, and uh, it just reminds me, in a good way, uh, law is not always perfect, but sometimes it can do some positive things. Uh, and, and I've thought about um, the importance of law, uh, as we've taught at the law school, when it comes to immigrant, immigration and immigrants. And one of the things that, that we uh, were able to, uh, to create at the law school a long time ago, long before I was here, is an immigration um, uh, law clinic that represents un undocumented and others seeking asylum and other relief from removal in the United States. Um, and a few years ago, actually almost 10 now, um, we created for the entire University of California system with the support of the president uh, of the University of California, 
uh, an immigrant legal services center that provides services to immigrant students and their parents on all the UC campuses. And um, I know it's been uh, uh, replicated a number of other places, but I, I'm, I'm very happy that we have that and we continue to house that here uh, and, and have a, a core group of attorneys that, that provide services to students in a way that's new and novel. Um, so I, I guess what I'm trying to say in part is I, I think of these issues as real and live and not just issues in, the, in the, from the history book like I'll be talking today. Uh, and, and the other thing I'll mention is I've spent almost all of my academic career thinking about how uh, systemic racism is embedded in our in our immigration laws. It's changed over time. Uh, different groups have been focused at different times in our history. Uh, but throughout that history, uh, racial subordination, in my mind, has been this, the the underlying principle tying together the cis immigration system. Uh, and um, uh, I think that that um, um, is, is important to keep in mind because as we tinker with the system today, we're tinkering with a system that has um, racial impacts, even though it often is in colorblind form. Uh, and, and I talk about some of these issues um, uh, in this article, Systemic Racism, the U.S. Immigration Laws, so, so I, I'd be, you know, if, if you're interested in learning more about that, you can t take a look at that article. Um, now, I, I, I became interested uh, in some of the history in part, be, part because of uh, the history in California um, of um, uh, attacking um, Chinese immigrants in the late 1800s. Uh, and uh, I spend parts of each summer up in the Sierras uh, uh, and and near, near not far from Lake Tahoe, but near near a place called Donner Lake. Uh, and one of the things that struck me as I was thinking about the area is that at one time there must have been many Chinese people here, many Chinese immigrants, because they built the railroad, they they tunneled through the mountains, it, it, Donner Summit, uh, and there was no sort of uh, indication whatsoever that there was uh, a Chinese population in, in the town of Truckee. Uh, and then I started looking a little bit at the history and realized that basically in 1870, a third of the population of the Truckee area was Chinese. Uh, but over a course of the next 50 years, really, there was in effect a, a, a cleansing, a, a, a violent cleansing of, of of Chinese people from the regions, so that today there's almost no indication that Chinese people ever lived there. And one incident, and it, it involved the law, so I'll, I'll mention it, is um, what's called the Trout Creek Outrage. And there's this creek near Donner Lake that borders a large uh, a luxury home development, the Tahoe Donner um, uh, development, uh, and Trout Creek is is at the the southern edge uh, of that development. Uh, and in, in the 1870s, some local vigilantes uh, decided that they were going to light a house on fire that housed a number of Chinese workers, um, uh, young folks working on the on the railroad. Uh, and in in the middle of the night, after they lit the fire, and the Chinese workers fled, uh, the white vigilantes uh, shot them and, and, and uh, injured many, killed one. Uh, and then they were tried for murder in the town. Uh, uh, actually, it was, it was the, the trial was in Truckee. Uh, and they were found uh, not, not guilty, uh, even though the evidence was pretty stark. Uh, and the town leaders at the time uh, had a, a nine-gun cannon salute honoring the the, the uh, acquitted defendants uh, and uh, fired the, the, the cannons. Uh, and, and as it turned out, one of the um, defendants was later the, the sheriff uh, for the town of Truckee, uh, and other town leaders very much supported the effort to rid the town of Chinese, including acts like the the, the Trout Creek outrage. Um, so I, I, I guess I, it, it's, 
I, I sort of backed into this history and started thinking about it. And unfortunately, there are histories like this in many cities in in the valley and in in, in uh, the foothills for sure. Uh, and it got got me thinking about um, you know the use of violence uh, and uh, immigrants uh, and and the history uh, of the immigration laws, which I, I thought about a, a fair amount. And, and that brought me to the Ku Klux Klan, which understandably is thought primarily uh, for uh, of when you think about the horrific violence that it conducted toward African Americans and still at times engages in. Um, and obviously, the KKK arose out of the, the Civil War and was an effort to maintain the racial subordination of the old Confederacy. Uh, at the same time, the Ku Klux Klan also uh, was, was pretty pretty clear from the very beginning uh, that immigrants weren't welcome as well, uh, that especially Catholics and Jews in the beginning uh, were the kinds of immigrants that were, in the Klan's view, ruining the country. And what I do in this paper, uh, and I, I, I'll, I'll Get, there's an abstract and a, a, a table of contents, and if anybody would like a copy, I'd be happy to share it. But in the paper, what I what I, I try to do is to um, outline the case that many uh, scholars really have just failed to look at the anti-immigrant foundations uh, and continuing legacy uh, of the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, the, the KKK xenophobia has, has been part of its foundation from the very beginning, but really in, in, in the various histories that look at the KKK is really little more than an afterthought uh, to the scholarly analysis of the Camp Lance activities. Uh, so what I wanted to do in, in this paper is to start to outline some of the impacts of the Klan uh, on immigration law and policy nationally. Uh, and uh, as I looked at that history, it became very clear to me, uh, although I kind of knew this from before, uh, that a lot of the Klan's views about immigration uh, are very similar uh, and were mirrored in the words and deeds of Donald Trump. Uh, and if you're a student of immigration, as I, I think many of you are, um, I'm sure you know that um, uh, uh, you know, the, the first Trump administration, and there's a possibly a second Trump administration, uh, kept uh, students of immigration and certainly kept immigration law professors incredibly busy. And so what I wanted to do in this paper is to shed light on the KKK's uh, views on immigration, its impacts on policy, uh, and show how that really is reflected in Donald Trump's immigration philosophy. Um, and so... Uh, let, let, let me begin, um, you know, in, in the beginning, uh, I have to say that the the Klan's focus on immigration really was secondary to its focus on um, terrorism and violence directed against African Americans. Um, but but then there, there, there began, came a time uh, when the Klan started focusing more on, on, on immigration. And, and one of the Klan's popular resurgences has gone up and down in our history was in the 1920s. Uh, and it's hard to imagine now, but, the, but at the time in the 1920s, the Klan was viewed as a, um, a, a conventional uh, political organization, a, a conventional group of people pressing their views, uh, not all that different from any other political group. Now we look at the Klan askance as, as out of sync with um, modern racial sensibilities. But in the 20s, uh, the Klan's racial sensibilities fit right into the mainstream. Uh, and in the Immigration Act of, of, of 1924, uh, also known as the Johnson-Reed Act, uh, Congress passed uh, a, a, a complex uh, but unquestionably discriminatory national origins quota system that were really designed to keep uh, Southern and Eastern Europeans out of the United States, also kept as a result, many, many uh, Jewish people and, and, and uh, uh, Italians. Um, Asians were 
it's also restrictive coming in this country. That was sort of a carry forward from the previous laws passed by Congress. Um, but what was interesting to me, I, I knew about the, the Immigration Act of, of 1924, but the, the, the Klan, which is popular at the time, as I mentioned, uh, was a big supporter of the Immigration Act of 1924. It was a potent and mainstream political force in the 1920s. Uh, and it was a major, not a, a secondary, but it was a major proponent of the 1924 Act. And, and that act fit very comfortably uh, into the anti-immigrant impulse that, that contributed to uh, the national origins quota system uh, and um, uh, carried forward a, a sort of racial animus towards particular groups. Now, one of the interesting things about the uh, Johnson Reed Act is it didn't apply to the Western Hemisphere, uh, the quota system, uh, and so it wasn't didn't take that long uh, for uh, white supremacists uh, to start getting concerned with uh, migration from Mexico, uh, and spurred by white supremacists, Congress uh, in 1929 passed the Undesirable Aliens Act of 1929. That act, which really hasn't gotten the attention it deserved, made illegal entry into the United States a crime. And it was really intended to combat Mexican immigration and to punish criminally Mexican immigrants who reentered the country. Now, the, the, the legislative history for the 1920 Act is replete, filled with anti-Mexican references. Uh, and this law, barring reentry into the United States, uh, continues uh, in, in, in um, later laws uh, to remain on the books. And in fact, uh, illegal reentry is one of the major, and in some regions, the major federal crime prosecuted by the federal government, uh, especially in the U.S.-Mexico border region. Uh, but this this illegal reentry law really came at a time uh, when the effort was to keep Mexicans out of the country. Now, later, um, uh, you know, the um, national origins quota system was eliminated. It was eliminated in 1965. And many people talked about how great that was, and in many ways it was great. Uh, the 1965 Immigration Act uh, allowed Asians to immigrate uh, to the United States in a way that the previous laws didn't. Uh, but for the first time in U.S. history, uh, the 1965 Act um, included a variety of provisions that allowed for restrictions on immigration uh, from Mexico and the Western Hemisphere. Uh, so the 1965 law, in many ways, uh, created a system where um, many people who wanted in the future to come to the United States from Mexico uh, and south of us uh, couldn't le legali legally and would have to be enter uh, without proper authorization and exist as undocumented immigrants in the country. So the 1965 Act is particularly important for Latinos uh, because uh, it really made it more difficult for Latinos to immigrate to the United States uh, and uh, made more of them undocumented immigrants if they did, did come here. Um, but, but, but let me go back a bit to the KKK, um, because um, they were prominent in, in the West uh, through, through, throughout um, you know, the post-Civil War history, which surprises some people. But there were, there were large clan um, uh, organizations in San Francisco, Los Angeles, uh, also in some cities in, in, the, in the central, in the valley, um, in, including Fresno, Bakersfield, uh, to Larry, uh, and these were uh, organizations that were viewed as upstanding, part of the community, uh, and uh, also at times engaged in anti-Asian, anti-immigrant violence in the 1800s at least. Uh, and um, vigilante groups fashioned themselves after the Klan in its activities to engage in violence against immigrant communities uh, it, as well. Uh, in fact, I, I, I talked before about Truckee, uh, and in, in, in Truckee, uh, a, a local newspaper man, Tr Charles McClashen, 
uh, he, he later became a member of the assembly, ran in one for the assembly. He wrote a commentary in his newspaper that was in tra- entitled QCUE Klux Klan, uh, where he uh, talked about how people uh, who um, cut off the uh, ponytail of Chinese men uh, should get a bounty, as like uh, people who uh, kill vermin in the community got a bounty at the time. Um, but it gave you an idea how a mainstream leader in the town of Truckee uh, viewed, viewed Chinese. Uh, but but the Klan uh, acted against immigrants, Mexicans and others in the West, acted against Chinese immigrants as well. Uh, and and um, the West, um, even though many people today think of it as a, um, a very liberal, um, really was the uh, center uh, of the political activity to bring us the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, which was the, the first comprehensive federal immigration law, uh, first immigration law that the federal government attempted to regulate all immigration, allowed for the exclusion from the country of Chinese immigrants. Uh, and California was, was, was a big supporter. Uh, and, and California supported that law in part because of the anti-Chinese sentiment in the state. Uh, and in part, that sentiment was uh, uh, exhibited in the violence the Klan and local va- vigilantes took took against um, uh, uh, Chinese people. Now, the Klan's sort of anti-immigrant animus really didn't end um, in, the, in the 1920s. Um, and, and it continues through to the to this this day. Um, Klan has at times organized um, patrols along the U.S. Mexico border. Um, there was one Klan leader, the Imperial Wizard of the Loyal White Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, he rejected the idea of amnesty for for undocumented immigrants, uh, and he says what he wanted was corpses on the U.S.-Mexico border, um, not amnesty for undocumented immigrants. Um, David Duke, when he was a member of uh, a leader in the Klan in 1977, announced that the Klan would actively patrol the border. The Klan also is engaged at various times in uh, activities directed at at Asian immigrants. Uh, With the end of the Vietnam War um, uh, uh, in the 1970s, uh, numbers of refugees from Vietnam came to the United States. Uh, the Klan uh, organized violent attacks on Vietnamese fishermen in the Gulf of Mexico. And, and the goal uh, was to, stated goal at least, was to protect white fishermen. Uh, Congress later narrowed the ability of the president to admit refugees uh, in a law called the Refugee Act of 1980 to try to avoid large numbers of Vietnamese and other refugees from coming to the country. So that's a little bit about the Klan. And, and now uh, I want to talk a little bit about so- something that, that we've all lived through. And you're uh, very familiar with, I'm sure. Um, now, uh, over time, uh, many mainstream political leaders in the United States uh, softened the talk and the rhetoric on, on immigration. Um, uh, Ronald Reagan, um, uh, Republican, uh, very conservative, uh, he signed into law the Immigration Reform and Control Act of 1986, uh, which included an amnesty for undocumented immigrants. Uh, and um, uh, you know, he, he viewed that law as a, a compromise uh, that that uh, w- was worth worth signing. Um, uh, first and second President Bush uh, had more moderate immigration positions than than, than, than previous presidents, uh, and um, uh, those are those are Republicans. Um, Donald Trump had a very different approach to immigration than any modern American president. Uh, and I think that uh, it, it's worth observing um, how much it is differs from other presidents, and in some ways, how dangerous 
uh, much more more dangerous it is than, than some other presidents. Uh, and this may sound not fair, but but I think it is. Uh, in my mind, Donald Trump's overall approach to immigration is more or less more or less in line with the KKK's anti-immigrant agenda. And the immigration position um, are bolstered um, by his desire and claim to make America great again. The Klan had a very similar line uh, slogan. Uh, they, they said that we should make America first. And actually, President Trump has also used that line too, that America first uh, is what is, is, gu- is guiding principle. And President Trump also is very clear about the importance of race to his immigration positions. Uh, he, he attacked in his uh, campaign announcement, his speech announcing his presidential run uh, in 2015, uh, 2016. He, he, he attacked Mexican immigrants as rapists and criminals. Um, later, he, he uh, said that we should bring back a mass deportation campaign uh, that President Eisenhower had followed in 1954. Trump didn't use the name of the campaign, which is Operation Wetback, um, but we get the idea that a mass removal campaign would undoubtedly affect many, many Latinos. While in office, President Trump uh, proclaimed that the nation did, need, did not need any more immigrants from asshole countries, uh, and he named El Salvador and Haiti uh, specifically. And he mentioned uh, that the nation needed more immigrants from white nations like Norway. So you get the gist of where President Trump uh, was thinking in his, his immigration policies. But but his racist attra- tax on immigrants and people of color uh, came in many ways other than through immigration law and policy. Uh, he repeatedly referred to COVID as the China flu or the Kung flu, as the nation reeled from the impacts of the pandemic. And while President Trump was saying things like that, uh, hate crimes against Asian Americans spiked. Um, now, to say that um, President Trump's positions are, on immigration are consistent with those of the KKK, uh, uh, if you take that as true, then it shouldn't surprise you that the KKK endorsed Donald Trump's presidential candidacy in 2016. Uh, And David Duke, a former uh, leader of the Ku Klux Klan, uh, uh, endorsed President Trump uh, uh, in his re-election campaign in 2020. Uh, And over time, President Trump uh, repeatedly uh, has refused to reject um, uh, the, the, the efforts of white supremacists to support his campaign or in times to engage in violence. He didn't condemn the um, uh, white supremacists engaged in violence in 2017 in Charlottesville, Virginia. We know that some of the insurrectionists in, in January 2021 in Washington, D.C. displayed white supremacist regalia and symbols, including Confederate flags. Um, in some, it appears that white supremacists were attracted to the hatred of immigrants and the aggressive immigration enforcement advocated by Donald Trump. Uh, And his positions seem to have encouraged other leaders to engage in similarly tough immigration enforcement positions. Uh, Greg Abbott, the governor of Texas, and Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida, obviously saw the political benefits of anti-immigrant rhetoric and measures, uh, uh, and uh, have followed those uh, and become quite popular in Florida and Texas because of those policies. Uh, Now, while Donald Trump's racism and anti-immigrant sentiment in some ways is very consistent with Klan ideology, uh, I think that we should not give the Klan too much credit or too much blame uh, unfortunately, um, is, is Derek Bell, um, one of the founding critical race theorists, noted, um, racism is at the core of American society, and in his view, is a permanent feature of that. 
So as we see throughout time, racism has come up, uh, receded, and come back in immigration law and policy. Uh, and, and to be specific about some of Donald Trump's you know, record on immigration, and I, I want to be specific on some of them, um, but but he, he often, as I mentioned, used charge, charged rhetoric, racist rhetoric, uh, and he also followed that rhetoric up with concrete measures. Uh, one of them was the, the Title 42 order that basically closed the border, uh, had a huge impact on, on Latino immigrants and other immigrants too, but uh, majority were Latino. Um, he ostensibly based it on COVID uh, and public health grounds, uh, but kept it much longer than the than the, the, the scientific community thought that was necessary. Donald Trump also uh, created an unprecedented return to Mexico policy where people who were applying for asylum uh, at the southern border uh, were returned to wait in Mexico for their claims to be decided. Um, sometimes that wait could be months, if not years, uh, and there weren't facilities or appropriate uh, conditions um, for the asylum seekers to, to, to wait um, uh, in Mexico. Uh, you all probably have heard of the, the Muslim ban where uh, you know, President Trump um, uh, issued an order barring uh, admission of, of um, lawful permanent residents from nations predominantly populated by Muslims from coming to the United States. Uh, he based that on national security grounds even though a number of Supreme Court justices found it that that rationale to be uh, dubious, um, the other thing where and this is another parallel between the Klan and Donald Trump, the Klan did not view its actions as being constrained by law. Uh, it didn't think that ordinary laws applied to them, uh, and they would engage in violence and other things in violation of the law. Uh, Donald Trump has a very similar disdain for the law. He doesn't, he had it as president, view the laws meaningfully constraining his various uh, immigration law and policy initiatives. He regularly pushed law to the very limits and often was found to have violated the law. Uh, when he lost, he criticized the courts uh, for coming to uh, dubious conclusions uh, and for unfairly blocking his immigration initiatives. So, so, you know, besides hating immigrants, uh, uh, Trump, similar to the Klan, views the law as not really limiting the way that immigrants should be treated. Um, that, now, just to be crystal clear, some of Donald Trump's measures particularly targeted uh, Latino migrants. Oh, I, I mentioned before that he, he had little use uh, for Latino immigrants coming to the United States. But he, he adopted some policies that are just uh, amazing in many ways. Uh, the family separation policy, where he separated parents from their children at the border, uh, uh, was, uh, in his mind, a, a way of deterring migration from Mexico. Uh, but it was so disturbing to so many Americans that once it became public, it was discarded after a few weeks. Um, the, the proposed, you know, Donald Trump's proposed wall between the United States and Mexico, um, uh, which is incredibly popular with some parts of, the, of his political base, uh, is really a, a symbolic um, indication of how much uh, he wants to separate Mexico from the United States, so wants to distance and wall off from the Mexican people any access to this country. Um, one thing that uh, other sort of I would, I would classify as an anti-Latino uh, measure was uh, the effort to rescind the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals policy. It, now, DACA didn't protect only um, Latino migrants, but close to 90% of the people who got protection under DACA were, were, were Latino. Uh, and that's not a fact that could have been lost on uh, 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 President Trump. Now, I don't think matters would change um, much if there's another administration of, of President Trump. 
Um, but he seems to have been more aggressive in his rhetoric in his campaign to this this point than he was in in, in the previous campaign. Um, in in the thing that struck many is so um, um, extraordinary uh, was uh, as Adolf Hitler did in talking about his hatred for Jewish people, we conducted um, and targeted for genocide. Uh, Trump damned immigrants for quote poisoning the blood of our country, uh, and and he's talked about a more aggressive approach to immigration if selected. Uh, and a and a less soft than his first administration approach to immigration. So in the end, I guess what what I'm trying to get across in this paper is that um, that um, Klan from this very beginning had had a very uh, negative view of immigrants, uh, in, in particular some like immigrant communities. Um, that uh, animosity has continued through to the present. Uh, and that hatred uh, for particular groups of immigrants uh, lives in uh, the uh, policies advocated uh, by, by by Donald Trump. I, I know it may sound um, like um, I, I'm, I'm trying to make a, a political point of some sort, and perhaps I am. Uh, but what what I really found uh, surprising to me uh, was how closely. The parallels between Klan immigration rhetoric and, and ideology uh, is mirrored in uh, Donald Trump's words and actions. And, and let me end there, and I'd be happy to to respond to questions to the extent I can, and, and talk about the paper and what it, whatever people wanted to raise. Thank you so much, uh, Dean Johnson. Okay, so now we can take um, questions, comments, feedback from the audience. If you have any questions or comments, please raise your hand and we can, and then unmute yourself. I'll call on you and unmute yourself. All right, so we have a question from Gloria. Yes, I was just wondering if, uh, uh, the speaker could address the um, social media, you know, helping to promote this ideology or this hatred and, um, you know, how that blends in with some of the policies and, you know, uh, that then later on shape um, laws. But I do know that some people respond to proposed, you know, laws uh, when they're not in place. So if he can just give some comments on that, appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, no, social media is um, a big way uh, that uh, white supremacists and other white right-wing groups try to um, change the views, the dominant views about uh, people of color and immigrants and the like, and at the same time, um, and and I know they you know don't like to be called dreamers, um, but one of the to me one of the most exciting social justice developments in the last twenty years has been young college immigrant students organizing um, and um, uh, you know. Moving government to do better, and I think DACA is a product of student activism, young student activism, and those students are very adept at using technology and social media to build movements. Uh, and so, I, I I don't think that you know it's an all a one sided um, calculus when it comes to social media, and, and I know the concerns with regulating social media um, um, uh, uh, it, it gotten a lot of attention um, I, my, my sense is and this is where I may not be as educated as I might want to be is that uh, to this point resources and sophistication of the right wing in its use of social media 
has outweighed um, the the you know, social justice advocates on, on the other side. But I, I I think it's one of those things that um, it, it requires our attention uh, and is important. All right, thank you for that question. All right, so we also have a question or comment from Manuel. Can you unmute yourself, Manuel? Okay, we'll go back to Manuel. We have a question from Eric. And so the question, okay, go ahead, Eric. Okay, uh, I was wondering about the DACA and the legal reasoning behind it, where uh, if they were brought here as children, they don't have a legal sense of agency, so they are protected. So this is something that should be able to survive a Supreme Court challenge if one is brought, right? I think uh, that's a good question. I think, um, uh, well, I should disclose this. Uh, I was among a group of 100 law professors that submitted a Supreme Court brief saying that um, we believe that the DACA was legal uh, and that um, um, provided limited relief uh, to, to young people brought here as, as children uh, and uh, should not be disturbed in that President Trump's um, rescission of DACA uh, was um, uh, violated the law because it didn't comply with some procedural requirements. Uh, our, our view was that DACA is legal it was a, a policy that, that President Obama put into place uh, and that uh, President Trump, uh, for racist and other reasons, shouldn't have been trying to um, uh, eliminate DACA. Um, now, that said, um, since the Supreme Court decision finding that Donald Trump uh, was wrong in rescinding DACA, there have been some legal challenges in other courts to DACA that uh, have uh, left its future uh, in um, an uncertain place. Uh, and one of the things that the Trump administration did uh, was after the Supreme Court decision uh, um, holding that President Trump had wrongfully eliminated DACA, um, the Trump administration decided that there would be no more new DACA applications granted. So DACA has been this program with no new applications. Renewals have been permitted, but the number of DACA beneficiaries has gotten smaller um, uh, as uh, over time, not bigger, because people can't apply anymore. And that has a huge impact on students in particular, but other young people who can't um, get DACA um, because no new applications are, are being admitted, accepted, and thus can't get work authorization, which DACA allows. Uh, and for our students, it means if you're undocumented uh, and you can't get DACA, uh, you, you know, you're in a real tough bind if you're trying to fund your education. Uh, because you can't, you don't have work authorization. Um, so, so uh, yes, I think DACA is legal, but it's been narrowed by the Trump administration and some and the courts. And I'm not sure what's going to happen to it in the future. And I know many young people are very afraid of what the likelihood is for DACA in the future. Okay. So, thank you again, Eric, for your question. We also have a question or comment from Heidi. Hello, thank you, Kevin. I've been wondering a lot about sort of, um, on one hand, Trump saying that he could potentially become a dictator for one day, right? The first day of his new presidency, if he was selected. Um, and on the other hand, all, all of these like, suggestions that he could mobilize um, state national guards to address immigration, and so I'm wondering if, the, if like these countries prepared 
legally or in some ways to sort of counteract this kind of, you know, kind of if he does, if he decides one thing on 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 day on one day, right, the first day or very early in his presidency, um, do we have any any do you have a sense of how will we the country um, react? I mean, we live in California, so um, I assume that we are a little bit safer, but um, in other parts of the country closer to the border, um, do you have any sense of what that might look like? Is it possible? In his first presidency, I kind of felt like, oh, the institutions are kind of stable enough to um, prevent crazy people from doing crazy things. After his first presidency, I'm not so sure about that. So what is your sense about the extent to which he can really enact um, a lot of violence in the country if he's reelected? Well, that's... the. That's a good. That's a great question, and it's the one. One of the things that I guess I worry about a lot. Um, I think that um, President Trump is is said at various times that he would send National Guard you know, along the border to try to enforce the border, uh, and um, um, and and I think at various times Democratic presidents have done that too, but usually to help and assist. In some ways, as opposed to actually enforce the border, um, and I, 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 I do think that we've seen over time the resiliency of the courts in halting uh, some action. I mean, the truth is, the courts have become more conservative because he appointed, you know, lots of judges when he's four years in office. Um, I'm like you. I think I am worried about the potential. Um, uh, for for all kinds of changes and possibly violence, um, but I do think at least at this point the courts uh, have been willing to serve as bulwarks of protection of rights and and restricting um, the power of the president. And so I, I I'm I you know uh, I and of course I can envision some truly horrible. Um, Actions that could be taken, and I and I, but I don't. I I think that so long as our institutions remain intact, including our judiciary, I, I think that we'll have some protection. Um, and um, I mean, of course, and I don't want to say this because I don't know. I, I I I don't think this will happen. I mean, we could have. I mean, uh, you, you couldn't. In, you know, um, imposed martial law or something. I mean, it, it, something like that. Uh, and if he goes there, then um, then you know, we're 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 going to have the very challenging um, constitutional showdown then. Uh, but I, I, the the way I think about it, uh, I guess, is that um, um, to me, and I'll just say for me. Uh, it's important that uh, we all think these things through before the election and, uh, and you know, engage in that political process because it may be a very uh, uh, important one for the next generation. All right. Well, thank you, Heidi, for your question. We also have some questions in the chat. So I'm going to uh, turn to some of those questions. Araceli has a question. Uh, she's asking, can you please address how immigration policy affects education policy? Well, um, it's funny. There's there's a lot of different ways that immigration policy affects education policy. I'll, I'll give you um, uh, uh, two two examples. One on that most people view is positive. One with with people of view is more mixed. Um, uh, one part of immigration, the immigration laws and policies to bring uh, foreign students, including graduate students to the United States to study. Uh, and over time, some presidents have made that easier and some presidents have made that harder. Uh, and sometimes just some presidents being in office makes, makes it harder for uh, the country to 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 get students from particular countries, for example, and this is I don't want to 
sound like I'm engaging some kind of diatribe, but um, uh, the Chinese government, when President Trump was in office, uh, stopped sending a lot of Chinese students to study in the United States uh, because um, there were con- the Chinese government had, had concerns. Um, uh, also, some presidents are much fast. Their administration is much fast, faster issuing visas for for foreign students uh, and are more welcoming or more willing to grant visas for foreign foreign students. Uh, and, and that's uh, that affects uh, the funding in higher education, affects uh, the, the diversity in the, in, in, in the classrooms. It affects all kinds of things in education. And, and the, we, you know, I can only speak for my, my small world. We have a, uh, a one-year degree for foreign lawyers and judges. And um, it, it enrich, enrich, we, we like to think that we, we, we help them learn American law, but also it enriches our students' experience learning from uh, foreign judges and lawyers about how law operates in their country. Um, so that's that's one example. Another, and this is one that affects more of us, uh, the, the Supreme Court in 1982 in a case called Plyler versus Doe decided uh, at, that undocumented immigrant children couldn't be denied access to the public schools. Uh, and that that is such an important decision uh, and it has it's had an impact for over a generation in school districts across the country, ensuring that the, the you know, undocumented children uh, would get a public education, at least through the 12th grade. Uh, and, and in my view, um, uh, that's been a positive, incredibly positive development uh, and a, an important Supreme Court decision. Uh, the, the issue, and, and I'm not saying it's an insignificant one, because I think it is a significant one, uh, the federal government's in charge of immigration. Uh, federal government can decide who to remove and who to admit in the country. Uh, but when it comes to providing a local public education, it's state and local school districts that are providing that state and local education. Uh, and in my mind, this is my view, uh, sometimes the federal government isn't as good as spreading resources to the state and local governments with large immigrant populations, including undocumented immigrant populations, and helping um, uh, provide an education to them. So, so I do think that, you know, there, there's an issue, an important one. Uh, I think it's a good thing that undocumented students are in the K-12 system. Otherwise, we, we, we would be um, damaging them in all kinds of ways, and in some ways damaging our, our, our own economy in certain ways. Uh, at, at the same time, I understand the pressures on state and local school districts to pay for uh, education. And so it seems to me uh, that there has to be more support from the federal government, which is in charge of immigration, to the state and local governments about providing an education. But in some ways, your question is an incredibly great one because um, education and immigration are so intertwined in my mind. I, I give you another example. Um uh, it, uh, when uh, President of the University of California, Janet Napolitano, was thinking about uh, an immigration center serving students, uh, undocumented students in particular, at it, 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 UC uh, campuses, she said something that made perfect sense. She said, we should provide uh, immigration advice through lawyers to the parents of undocumented students and students um, uh, because they'll be better students if they're not worried about their parents getting deported, uh, which kind of is obvious. I guess I, sh- you know, that's obvious. Um, but um, uh, I, I think it's uh, it was an important realization that um, uh, the immigration status of your family members can affect your education experience and have a huge impact on your your ability to um, uh, focus on your education. Uh, and, and for me, that was a, a thoughtful uh, a moment where I learned learned something by by listening to somebody knew something. Um, so uh, I, I think your question is a great one, and um, it, it's I think of it a lot, frankly, um, because we have a, a um, I'm not sure what the percentage is, uh, but we have a number of uh, immigrant students at the law school, including DACA students and, and some without DACA, 
Uh, and um, uh, we have a, about 25% of our students are first generation, a lot of them immigrant students. Uh, and um, um, I, I think they add so much to the law school and I think we need them so much uh, in the real world. Uh, I also think sometimes, um, um, uh, you know, uh, it, it's hard to adjust, uh, you know, to a um, um, educational environment for first generation folks. And I, and I don't say that in a condescending way. I'm a first generation college student myself. Uh, and I, I found it very hard to, um, how do you say, learn the ropes. Uh, and, and I think that, and I think that when I think about our students, cause I, I know it's hard and I, and I know it's true for students on the, on the campus as well. Uh, and, uh, I, you know, uh, you know, and, and we have students who, um, uh, learn la English later, later in their lives. And they're put into a, basically an English learner environment and asked to succeed. And, and we have many, a lot of, a lot of them do. It's just challenging in ways that some of us can't really imagine, I think. Uh, and um, so uh, since I spend my time at a university, your question touches on a lot of things I think about all the time. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Araceli. And we also have a question from Bernadette. Hi, thank you, Dean Johnson, for your very insightful talk today. My question is more of a general question about immigration policy in general. I'm, I understand that, of course, it's very complex immigration law and policy and that, you know, the United States immigration system is pretty broken. But what do you think would be some solutions moving forward for, you know, kind of mitigating some of the issues around immigration in this country? And then do you know of any societies that are doing a better job? with immigration because i know it's not just a, a problem yeah. that is you know affecting the united states it's, it's a global phenomenon so anyway any insights on that i'd appreciate yeah no um the second question i'll get to first uh uh and, and this is not a perfect approach um but the european union uh mm -hmm. has an embraced an approach where there's free migration within the EU bloc, um, exchange of goods is in, in, uh, goods and services in the EU bloc, and the movement of labor uh, in that, uh, and no internal borders with, within the EU. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and there's all kinds of problems, but in my mind, that's a much more sensible approach um, than a, a, you know, a borders between neighbors approach. Uh, I could imagine a North America union uh, with uh, free free migration of, of of people between Canada, the U.S., and Mexico, and exchange of goods and services between those nations. And unfortunately, I think that issues of race and class make it more difficult for a North America union, to call it that, to be created than. A European Union, um, but but I, I think something some regional arrangement makes a lot more sense um, because the demand for migration often is highest among neighbors, uh, and um, uh, we, we should um, understand that the flow of people um, is sort of a, a natural um, uh, sort of offshoot of economic uh, and other activity. Uh, but I, I, I think um, well, even more generally than something like that, um, um, I, I wrote a book, you know, a while back uh, um, about, you know, open borders and why America needs to rethink its borders. Uh, and I wasn't really calling for open borders, but much more uh, permeable borders, which allow people to come uh, to work. Uh, and we have a system now that was created in the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1952, uh, which was originally designed to keep communists out of the country uh, and really isn't aligned with our goals now of uh, of um, ensuring uh, uh, 
national prosperity and satisfying the needs of the labor market, as well as keeping out uh, criminals and national security risks. Uh, so I, I think we have to really think hard about what our needs are as we become an aging country uh, in the demographics of the nation change. Uh, and we find that we repeatedly, uh, in particular industries in particular, you know, especially, need um, uh, workers. Um, we, we as a country have to think about how our immigration laws can help us secure that labor force uh, and, and um, 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 you know, uh, allow us our economy to thrive. Uh, and, I, and so I think it's, a lot of it, I think, requires a whole new perspective on borders and immigration um, you know, with sort of the, the initial impression not being one of negative and bad, but something being positive and good. Uh, because I think uh, that, that, that really is um, important. Okay. Thank you, Bernadette, for your question. And we also have some questions from students in the SOCH 122 class. There's a question from Cindy who's asking, what advice could you give us to address the everyday Latinx DACA recipient who's also a Trump supporter? Uh, uh, that's a good question. It's a, it's a great question. Um, and, um, and, and it, I do think it's a fair criticism to say, you know, um, uh, that, you know, um, uh, the most basic level, um, the way that president Trump approaches immigrants, uh, and in my view, also people of color, um, um, is just unacceptable. He doesn't view them as people or human beings. Uh, he doesn't view them as having feelings. The only way you can you can um, decide that it's okay to separate a mother and child or a father and child is if you think that you're dealing with inanimate objects. Uh, and I think that the way that he talks about um, immigrants. Uh, and people coming from, for example, SO countries, is just unacceptable. His willingness to engage in mass detention and, and, and to uh, continue to um, wall the border when people are dying along the border shows his lack of appreciation for Latino lives because we know who's dying along the border on a daily basis. Uh, and and I think that um, sometimes I get students who want me to make statements about all kinds of things in the world. And I understand that. Actually, I, I appreciate that. But one of the things they never ask me to make a statement on is, uh, you, know, you know, Dean Johnson, will you please criticize all the people dying along the U.S.-Mexico border? Uh, even though when I think about it, it makes me very, very upset every day. Um, and so I, I, I think to me, it's just unacceptable um, the President Trump's willingness to treat immigrants and people of color as less than human. Uh, and I think, um, and I don't want to get myself in trouble, but the way that he talks about women is uh, very similar and to me is unacceptable. Uh, and, uh, I, and I think that yet people who might support his policies have to think really hard about whether... Um, that general approach is something that they're willing to buy onto. I I, I, I don't want to sound like a, you know, a, a, an ideologue, um, but I found, uh, even though I disagreed with many of, of his policies, uh, I found that George W. Bush's approach to immigration was much more palatable to me. And he understood, in my estimation, he understood the humanity of the people affected uh, and I, I appreciated that. Uh, I didn't like some of the policies and I didn't, but I, but I didn't, to me, part of the debate that occurs currently in some um, circles um, uh, is just so debased and disgusting that it makes me uh, very sad. And as you probably can tell, a little angry. 
Yeah. So thank you. And thanks to the students and to everyone else um, for asking such great questions. Just as a friendly reminder for the students, uh, please be sure to um, complete the survey at the end of the talk. So we also have another question, sort of related question from Ahmed. Uh, Ahmed Correa is saying, thank you, uh, Dean Johnson, for your interesting presentation. Even though I value how your research brings to light the connections between the KKK, migratory control, and Trump administration, how do we understand the transformation or changes or the continuation of their supremacist narrative into Democrat administrations? Research has shown historic records of deportation under Obama. And we know also about Trump's regulations kept in place under Biden. So essentially the complicity, right, of the Democrats, the Democrat, the Democrats. Yeah, no, that's a good question and a good point. And I will make a confession. Uh, I served on um, Senator Obama's immigration policy group in 2008 uh, when he was coming up with some ideas uh, for 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 um, the campaign, uh, and um, there was lots of ideas, and um, not a lot of them came out in the administration. Uh, and um, uh, I and many other people were deeply disappointed in the Obama administration's approach to immigration, uh, and uh, to uh, in, in your record saying that. Um, he, he, his administration set records for removals. Uh, he, he was referred to in some immigration quarters as a deport, the deporter in chief when he left office. And I think that it's, it's fair to say um, that um, Democrats haven't always been a lot better on immigration than Republicans. Uh, and sometimes some Republicans are better on immigration than Democrats. Uh, and, and so I don't, to me, uh, that's actually one of the things that I always try to get across in talking about the politics of immigration. It's not a red, blue, Democrat, Republican issue. Uh, it's a really complicated issue. And anybody who tells you it's simple is telling you the truth. Uh, you will see in the next few months, the Biden administration probably going towards uh, more tough immigration controls as the election nears. And, um, and, and I think, you know, that's telling us that um, that tough approach gets votes. Uh, and one of the things that's, you know, you know, uh, Ron DeSantis is popular in Florida. Uh, Greg Abbott is popular in Texas. There is part of this nation that very much um, um, uh, likes tough immigration enforcement. And I was just talking to a reporter today about polls showing that Latino citizens were becoming more conservative on immigration uh, than, than they were previously. Uh, and and uh, so I, I think that you're exactly right. And in in, we have Eric Adams, the mayor of New York, a Democrat, complaining about immigrant criminals, uh, yeah, although he, he can't substantiate that. Uh, but but it, what he can say, and I think it's fair, and I'll, I'll mention it, it's like the education. Federal government's in charge of immigration and, 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 and uh, I think should do what it can to help state and local governments deal with migrant flows. Uh, and I, I know that it's costly, uh, but it, it's, you know, in part a, a federal obligation. And so I understand where, where um, Governor, I mean, uh, Mayor Adams is coming from, um, but I don't think we should be blaming the migrants for uh, consuming benefits blame them for a crime that they didn't commit. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed, for that question. And we also have Eric Orellana. Eric, do you have a question or comment? Thanks, Elga. Uh, hi, Dean Johnson. My name is Eric Orellana. I wanted to thank you for the presentation you shared and uh, just your uh, efforts in highlighting the, the prevalence of racism in the Trump administration's uh, approach to immigration laws. Um, it's really important to highlight the the racism that has existed uh, historically and is currently being employed by uh, the Trump administration and other Republican uh, politicians uh, in light of Latino support for anti-immigrant politicians. Um, I was interested to hear your perspective in terms of the legal strategies that um, 
uh, immigrant groups uh, might turn to uh, if uh, the Trump administration uh, is reelected in the upcoming election cycle. I know you mentioned uh, some of the signing on to letters um, in, uh, in terms of DACA efforts and just wanted to hear your thoughts on what the immigration battle looks like with uh, conservative Supreme Court and just more general conservative judges and immigration courts as well. I, I truly think that um, we can't rely on the courts if we want to bring about positive change for immigrants and immigration law. I think that uh, the courts can help blunt some of the really bad things that bad pol politics might bring. But I think, I think that uh, you know the, the immigrant student activists have the right idea in, in saying we have to push for um, more humane laws. We have to get people to realize that immigration uh, uh, is tied together, like the name of the center, race, immigration, social justice. These things are all intertwined. Uh, people too often think of immigration as sort of a peripheral issue um, um, and not a central civil rights issue like I think it is. Uh, that it impacts uh, particular communities much more so than others. So, but I, I think the answer is political activism and organization, uh, going to the courts when you don't prevail in the political process and try to protect what you can protect. I, I agree with you that you know, the courts are more conservative than they've been in the past. Uh, although even this conservative Supreme Court stopped Donald Trump from rescinding DACA uh, and has actually had a number of decisions that less significant ones um, uh, that, that have been important. And, and I think, you know, the Supreme Court also, not that long ago, 2012, uh, struck down most of Arizona's uh, SB 1070, which is a, a, a tough immigration enforcement law. Um, didn't strike it all down, but struck down a lot. And I and that was a pretty conservative court too. So I, like I said, I don't I don't think immigration is a liberal conservative issue, and I and I think that um, um, you know uh, it's still possible in the courts. But I think where you're more likely to you, you really have to strive for is the political process, because one of the things you, you know you you see is that um, you know. Um, you know a president can do a lot of things through immigration law and policy. Uh, and if you don't like what the president might, a candidate might do in immigration law and policy, maybe you should um, vote for somebody else. All right. So we have basically run out of time. I'd like to thank once again to our distinguished speaker, Dean Kevin Johnson, for that amazing presentation. Thank you so much to all of our audience members. And I'm sorry we didn't get a chance to ask all the questions. There are a ton of questions I see still in the chat. Uh, thank you so much again for attending our presentation. And once again, for Dean Johnson for making time out of his incredibly busy schedule to visit with us. We look forward to reading your article, Dean Johnson. So again, gracias. Thank you on behalf of the Center on Race, Immigration, and Social Justice. And also special thanks to the organizing committee, um, the folks that helped put this event together, including Manuel Barajas, Hari Sarabia, Ana Gutierrez, Nitika Sharma. Thank you again once once again. So thank you. Have a wonderful afternoon, everyone. Thank you so thank much. You.